Robots Radio presents... Today's chat is brought to you by the support of all our Twitch subscribers. Through the patronage you provide the Focus Fire chat team through the Twitch platform, we are able to provide you with the weekly podcast as well as the website and other aspects of Focus Fire chat. If you have any interest in becoming a subscriber of the FFC and gaining access to some exclusive features over in the Discord server, please be sure to visit our Twitch account and click on the subscribe button. If you're an Amazon Prime member, remember that you do have a free subscription to Twitch every month that can be used for this. And for those of you who are already subscribers, thank you again for your generosity. Welcome to Focus Fire Chat. Explore together. Welcome to Focus Fire Chat, recorded live on September 18th, 2020, over on twitch.tv slash Focus Fire Chat, as we continue our discussion over the darkness. This particular episode will A, be in the wrong order, and B, will serve as what we have come to call the advanced session of the week's exploration. If you don't understand point A, you weren't in live stream, you should do that. Uh, congratulations I, to those mm. who signed up for a deeper dive. <laughs> Before we go any further, because she's going to interrupt me again anyway, however, let's run through a quick introduction of who we have with us on the show. As always, this it's is green. your host. For- <laughs> 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 uh, uh, okay. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to interrupt last, Blue. But definitely not least, in the hot seat is <laughs> guest co-host. We have our good friend Dwyer Fire. Dwyer, Hi. how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> to explain what blue was saying about point a we took our like when we record in live stream we always do intro episode or intro session and then take a small break and then start the advanced session well chat was doing such a good job of like directing us and asking questions and we had such a healthy debate while during our break that actually just continued that blue and i decided to actually throw this into uh, the advanced session. So you're going to hear things that don't sound like the normal podcast because they're not directed necessarily from show notes like we normally do. It's going to have a lot more free form, just like you would have a, if you're hanging out with us in chat. So that's what Blue meant by the introduction. <laughs> that being said, what we want to talk about, darkness. Stasis is going to be a trick. Still waiting for the shoe to drop here. One thing that I've been troll tooling with is the speaker's first line to us back in D1. In his dying breath, the traveler created the ghost to seek out those who can wield its light as a weapon, guardians to protect us, and to do what the traveler itself no longer can. Yeah, how's the ghost going to be able to uh, handle the darkness? One ghost? Maybe not well. Well, All the ghosts? Maybe they make a giant laser beam. Here's a theory for you. Bungie is talking about making the mod slots available for the ghost, but what if there's something that we can actually, what if there's, what if they write a lore reason for us to be able to have stasis using our ghost? What if they actually make that a thing where it's not necessarily a darkness mod insert, but I don't know, something. It's just an idea. I mean, they've already touched into it, if you think about it. Think about the first time we got near the pyramid. The ghost itself says, I can feel something reaching into me. Mm -hmm. So if they commit to letting the ghost decide that, hey, this darkness is reaching into me, I'm going to let it take over. Now you have stasis. Yeah. Yes, the shard in the EDZ was considered corrupted. It was, from our understanding, it was part of the original break off of the Traveler back during the Collapse which makes you wonder if the darkness had some sort of blast that actually did it or not. Don't know. Rasputin nuked it. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of people who still want love that theory. Possibly letting us have a darkness fish. I think those things are freaking adorable, and I would rather have that than my ghost. No offense to my ghost. He's just kind of If our ghost eye turns red when we get stasis, that'll be problematic. Does Asher still have powers? That's open for debate. God bless it. <laughs> Buddy in the background looking like, what, what What happened? I don't see it. Right, Black Flag, but the fact is that 
in my understanding, if you don't care about right or wrong, that still means that you recognize right or wrong. So you still are a moral agent because the fact is that you recognize that there is a right or wrong. You don't care about it. That's cool. But you still recognize it. You are still morally considered a free agent with regards to culpability. Yeah. So like my dino, I agree with you on there. Like stasis. My question with stasis is that I am very curious how they are going to fit it within the trifecta that exist as base elements. Um, because we have an established cycle of those elements already. So my theory is, is that stasis is going to be the state of, uh, state of matter between void and solar i think was the one i came up with that made the most sense yeah because because it goes solar arc void and then it comes back to solar arc void and so i think stasis would make sense between void and solar because it's the frozen point at which part the fact that stasis is going on to weapons armor how the are the foundries wielding so-called paracausal powers? Has it been confirmed that stasis is a paracausal power? I mean, that it's it's just the same as paracausal power as void would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, but void isn't a paracausal power. The ability to wield it in the way that we wield it is paracausal. Void is right, in but itself the a base stasis element. isn't necessarily a paracausal power. No. It's absolute zero. It is the, right. It, it yes yes it is, you're correct. Yeah, it is. It is as much of a paracausal power as solar, arc, or void is, and none of those are paracausal powers. The paracausal power is the ability to summon them without having to cause the summon. Is it, It's the sidestepping of causality to summon them into existence. It's me making a small Trigger. throwing hammer show up and then hit you in the exactly. face. Exactly. Without yeah. crafting that hammer and then lighting it on fire, you just it just appears. The problem trigger is if you say the idea that stasis is entropy, even though it's something we've talked about on the show for, at this point, years, Twitter's going to lose it. Well, but it, I mean, I don't, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I agree with you, Dino. I think that the way that, yeah, the way... The thing is, is at the end of the day, the more and more it seems is like it's the moral spectrum. It's not the elemental spectrum. Like you have stasis, arc, void, solar, and then how you use it falls within light and dark. But the fact that you can use it has nothing to do with if you're light or dark. Well, here's the question that we were kind of discussing a little bit ago when you had stepped away. And this may be just something to talk about in the episode, too. We were discussing the concept of if we are actually wielding the darkness, how is our ghost able to handle that? Because the ghost is used to function, to um, tether the light, not necessarily the darkness. So what is our tether to the darkness? Or do we even need one? So, Dino brought that one up yeah, earlier, the too. Ghost, the ghost, as it stands currently wouldn't be able to do that and and, and i mean in some cases i would argue that the the ghost as it stands today would cease to exist because it would be introducing matter to antimatter like they i don't think they can coexist Mm. i don't think the ghost would you coexist but it depends are they the same thing or not and it's purely a usage of it no no i mean because that goes back to like the energy of i kind of argue that Hmm? I, I don't know if we actually can. I, I don't know. I, I still am on the fence on whether or not we actually use light and dark as a as an like, elemental existence. I don't. <laughs> a red setting. Night potato. So I swear that's the red wedding. That too. Because that's that's the thing is like if you look at Drifter's ghost. Drifter could arguably be said to have wielded darkness, and his ghost has two settings, the blue light and the red light, or the blue eye and the red eye. I'm calling it now that we are going to, we're going to go and we're going to meet the stranger, and we're going to witness the marriage between Eris Morn and the Drifter, and we're going to finally see the marriage between the darkness and Drifter complete. Yeah, no. Um, the other thing that it also means is that the stranger could actually wield paracausal abilities. Because guess what? The fallen are getting the darkness. So that means that you don't have to be risen to actually wield it. Green's been writing I, fanfics. 
so wielding stasis i consider like wielding any of the normal three elements i'm gonna call them elements and if you watch through the even the hive we look at nocris nocris uses his hellfire we look at knights they shoot fire at us so those are all solar damages uh something like that now that knight isn't protruding that fire from anything specifically that nocris is just summoning fireballs and throwing them at us Mm -hmm. if you're looking at this they're just learning a new power almost so i don't think the hive or or not the hive the uh i don't think the fallen are becoming like the agents of darkness or anything i think they're just wielding a power they found like they would wield the uh siva from it well uh, right well Well, the other thing about the hive is that their equipment channels the elements too so like the acolytes with their their um their void damage that's actually the only hive item or the only hive like force that is not necessarily channeled through an equipment that you can see clearly would be the thralls claws they do arc damage and then the wizards with their poison cloud like everything else is so, in from the for the rank and file hive is actually through a either a boomer or a um uh the rifle that they have or the pistol that they have mm-hmm. So, what if the fact that the Traveler is around is what allows us to, quote-unquote, utilize the light because it is the conduit slash battery or whatever we're going to call it, but because the pyramids are here and they've been grooming us to manipulate and capture Dark and everything, and Drifter has been Drifter's grand plan of Gambit to teach us how to deposit moats has finally come to fruition with this whole pyramid thing. And he's been grooming us to do moats of darkness and everything. What if the pyramids themselves are actually attuning to us so that we can use the pyramids as a sort of battery, just like the Traveler? I mean, it's not necessarily we're getting a paracausal power, but we're getting access to the paracausal power because of the battery in the background. Wait, who's grooming us? Drifter and the pyramid ships, like the the when you're doing the scales, right? Yeah, on I O or, or I mean, Titan. Makes sense to me. And Drifter has talked about how Gambit has been a a preparation for something to come, right? Like it's been his plan. He's been told to have Gambit be a thing by the Nine, which is really spin foily, I know, but it's... Oh, God. I think I broke... Thank you for the gift, Sub Lux. I think I broke Dino. I mean, it would make it would make sense that if one side can bestow that, then the other side would be able to as well. I mean, that, that mm-hmm. goes back into Justin's theory about, you know, us being Spectrum recipients, like being being picking up on the Spectrum of that particular energy sign. Mm-hmm. Can we just count this as the episode? Because I feel like we're just still talking about the darkness, and we could just tag an intro at the beginning of I it. I will probably do that. Blue, by your definition, when you think about the pyramid scales, what would you dis- like? When you think of the word scale within that, how do you think of it? If like that makes the, sense. Like expand on that just a bit. So at first, we all thought of them as Doritos, pyramid ships, whatever you wanted. Mm-hmm. Now we see these in game as listed pyramid scales Mm -hmm. when you think about that and you read the word scale where does your mind define that word that's scale mail like if you watch the way that portion of something larger yeah if you watch the way that they like look like they fit into the the larger ships they actually look like they come off of it like it's like a uh, it's like scale or uh what's um the modern reptilian scale type thing or snake uh, scales the, is it dragon scale? Is that the military armor that they have now? Like it's 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 scale mail. It's basically mm-hmm. scale mail, which is basically all the little uh, bah, 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 the little like literally scales that are folded over and they just lay on top of each other. Uh, it's actually really cool. Like oh my god, the technology! Like it's fascinating looking at the technology of dragon scale armor because it's like wow, mm-hmm. those guys in the medieval period knew their <laughs> they knew what they were doing. Yeah. See, but yeah, no, I, I, always like, read that's, oh. I always read it as like the like the a scale of uh, of skin. Yeah, I always read it as they were weighing us. I can see they that were measuring too. our light. Yeah, 
That could also, I mean, that is a very, you got to love um, semantics. That is a very easy read from the concept of what a scale is. If you want to go another route, which actually doesn't apply nearly as neatly as either of your two routes, you could also argue scale as in a musical scale. Mm-hmm. Well, dancing, a tuning, dancing's kind of where I was thinking. Like scales of the pyramids are like shards of the traveler. What if the umbral core that Sola is fishing around for inside Guardians isn't everyone, and the bank that would... makes that drop out? Yeah, I could see that. Hmm. Interesting. Explain. What were you saying? Music scales? Was, oh, I was just saying that it would be, you can uh, just play with the idea of attunement with a musical scale, because a musical scale is a series of notes that are generally played sequentially that actually work together harmoniously. Um, they don't have to, they don't have to be um, harmonious as in they all sound pretty. They can be disjunct. You can have scales that are um, you have 12 note scales instead of an eight note scale because traditionally Western music has eight notes, but you can have 12 notes. You can have some uh, Middle Eastern countries use like a 16 note scale depending on um, tradition and whatnot. So it would just be an attunement type thing, but I, I don't like it nearly as n- neatly as the weighing of the scales or the s- scale of the pyramid itself. Lots of little interpretations, though. Lots of little interpretations. What else do we want to debate about in the advanced session, since that's what we're kind of calling this and tacking it on later? Let's do an intro, and then I'll Frankenstein it back. Yeah! Frankenstein! This is going to be the awkwardest thing. What do we want to do now? I mean, mean, darkness. Is darkness taste like chocolate? Yeah, that's why it's disgusting. Why'd you say that? Now I want to go get chocolate. You take that back, Blue Crew. No, chocolate is chocolate's <laughs> gross. Okay, are you talking like all chocolate, or are we talking like dark no. chocolate? Dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. I love dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. You take disgusting. that. Disgusting. You're disgusting. <laughs> this is true. Anyways, so darkness is a necessary component. <laughs> Moving straight on and not addressing that particular problem. <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> Pissed off, chat. <laughs> <laughs> Success. Um, <laughs> it's like, how do you start now? I'm just after the chocolate at the debate. responses I'm getting. Um, so, like, real quick to kind of go back to the intro session, like, you know, the argument of darkness as a necessary component. Um, I, I, I kind of see that as the debate kind of centering around darkness as a necessary component of what we, what we kind of would define as free will of humanity. Um, it's, it's really similar to the real life debate of necessity of moral evil within a cosmos of what's referred to as libertarian free will. Um, and in that, what that means is like within that model, you have to have the possibility of evil Otherwise, any will within it is unable to be really considered truly free. If you if you don't have the ability to choose one or the other, you don't have a choice. Like if I say, all right, you know, you can have anything you want except that. Well, that's not anything you want. That's anything you want with a qualifier. That is not actually truly free. Um, so that that is what my kind of view of that whole thing is um, that being said the concept also ties into the the very big debate of natural versus moral evil which is what i mentioned in the intro session um and that is able to be really clear uh, really defined as basically two concepts of evil uh the first one is the narrow concept of evil this is really really kind of easy to explain narrow concept of evil is really just the like the most morally despicable sorts of actions characters events etc um the thing about narrow concept is that it can only be ascribed to what's called a moral agent and their actions or in other words humanity um and this is usually when you hear 
evil within contemporary moral, political, and legal context, this is the concept that's being applied. Like, this is the, what they're talking about. Um, the other concept is the broad concept of evil. This is where it gets really kind of dicey. Um, because broad concept is any bad state of affairs, any wrongful action or character flaws, um, really anything. Uh, the, the times that you will see a lot of this concept being applied is within theological texts, uh, such as theodicy or the problem of evil, the debate about the problem of evil. That's what usually you'll see this particular thing here. Um, within the broad concept is where the, the debate between moral and natural evil that we've kind of been talking about, that's where this falls. Um, moral evil is defined as bad states of affair which do result from the intentions or negligence of moral agents. And natural evil is uh, bad states of affair which do not result from the intentions or negligence of moral agents. Um, an example of a natural evil is the fact that, you know, like we kind of like I had kind of said in the intro session, um, the world is a real thing, not a realm of shadows and appearances. That, so the environment around us exists according to the principles inherent to their nature. An example of this would be, you know, wind will knock over a tree that has grown old and rotted. And, you know, if you leave a rock out for centuries, it will actually eventually crumble. Um each thing operates according to the principles that shape its activity. So animals follow instinct, you know, weather adheres to the laws of thermodynamics, and even stars obey the laws of physics, um, which is why within those particular uh, realms of science, those things are always changing is because we are under we are learning more about our environment and we are we are expanding our knowledge about it. Um so that's why, you know, ultimately speaking, science is a giant theory. You know, the empirical theory is that that is, you know, that's what it is. That's why we that's why we do the scientific method is to test those hypotheses to to grow in our knowledge. Um, but natu- the, the important thing here is that natural evil is something that we don't cause. Like it's it's something that just is a result of the stuff in the universe around us. Uh, whereas moral evil is something that we cause. So natural evil would be your natural decay, your entropy, the breaking down of things, right? Yes, I believe so. I think that's, yeah. Yes, or as Chad Where- has decided, a moral evil is blue hating chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, now now we're getting to Chad's- debate. It, it trigger, triggers defending me. He says only dark chocolate. <laughs> okay, so actually, let's use that. Let's <laughs> let's use that little thing. So, if it is a if blue disliking dark chocolate is a moral evil, but blue having not a major distaste for like milk chocolate, does that still? Like, how does that play on the evil scale? Is that still a, an evil of it? Or is it because you, is it because the ex- exclusionary aspect of it? I'm getting way too philosophical and ethical about chocolate at the moment. I mean, but it's, it's, gonna... so the thing is, is that goes into, so I mean, like, I know you're, you're being tongue in cheek, but actually that's, that's really a good segue into it is like, that ties into the idea that morality is not fixed, like that morality is um, okay. because morality. So there, this is kind of it's a difficult thing because you have to there's a there's a whole host of different um, uh, axiomatic beliefs that will determine how you view uh, morality. Right. Um, morality mm-hmm. is often defined just to kind of go through this real quick. Morality is defined as principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. Um, you can also define it as the extent to which an action is right or wrong. Uh, you can understand then that when I say morality is not fixed, you have to take into the context, the social and the historical uh, situation in which a statement is being made about the morality of a particular action. Um, now, within morality, that is where you have the school of thought that's referred to as ethics, and that's where a lot of ethics takes place. Now, ethics really falls into three rough categories. Uh, your first one is meta-ethics. These are really questions of really big, big picture questions. That is not the question of my like of or dislike of chocolate. This is things of like, are humans evil? Or, you know, like huge level questions, 50,000 foot view questions. Um, 
normative mm-hmm. ethics is the second group. Uh, these are questions that deal with what we ought to do. So this would be, you know, going back to our chocolate thing. Should I should I like chocolate or should I eat chocolate if I don't like it? You know, like if I don't like chocolate, is it appropriate for me to tell someone that it is not good for them? That's a normative ethic question. Like how do I how what ought I do in a situation? Um, and then applied ethics is the final kind of category within the ethical thought process. And applied ethics addresses specific practical issues issues and specific challenges that we face daily. So this is where, quite firmly, the chocolate debate falls in. Um, now, within morality and within ethics, you will, and, and actually even within this conversation, we have repeatedly said the words moral agent. Uh, real quick, the full definition of a moral agent is an entity who has the ability to discern right from wrong and be held accountable for their actions. And those are both equally important parts of the definition, because by expecting people to act as moral agents, we hold them accountable for the harm they cause others. Now, this is also why within legal and political and even some religious connotations, uh, moral agency is assigned to those who can be held or only held uh, responsible for their actions. So a lot of times you will see the argument that children and adults with mental impairment or uh, extremely old individuals are not usually considered full moral agents in this definition. Uh, that's why within, uh, you know, within the United States Codex of Laws, we have a different way of treating minors than uh, the adults when it comes to legal matters. Like minor co- That's why there are two different justice systems, really, for how we treat that, um, because in the minor court of appeals, that is not usually, they usually are handled <clears throat> with a little bit more um, gentleness, I think would be the the most appropriate term. It's not necessarily the best term, but like there's a, there's an understanding that they are not fully a moral, an independent moral agent. That's not to say that what they did is not wrong. It's to say that they are not fully culpable of what of of knowing what they are doing um now you know you can get into a very heated debate over what the age the you know this just like fixed age of uh maturity is um that i'm not going to get into but that's where that's where you see that distinction mm, there the problem is with that distinction and even from a legal uh perspective is that culpability is based off of your acknowledgement of understanding what you're doing, right? Correct. So life experiences would dictate Correct. your that is, that maturity is, in yes, that. A hundred percent. That is the problem with codice- codicizing moral agency um, because that that's, that's the crux of the issue actually is because you have to have, you have to have, um, uh, uh, qualifications that are applicable universally and unbiasedly to people, but you're dealing with people who are unique in and of themselves. And so you can't have a universal constant with something that is by its, by its own designation and by its own existence, unique right. and not universal. That is the, so struggle. we go by the rule of averages. Yeah. And I mean, ba- basically that is sadly the, the state of, I mean, that's just, yeah, sadly that is the truth right there is the, the you just, if you're an outlier, you're going to either benefit or, or be, be, um, uh, it's going to be a detriment. Yeah. It, that's, that's the really sad part about that, but that's the mm-hmm. argument of culpability. Um, so when you, when we talk about that, you know, like the, um, uh, so, yes, actually, that is not actually correct. Uh, Wicked is saying, you know, here's the problem. By saying that darkness is a moral agent, we're saying it's not being influenced by something outside its own power. No, I am not saying that. I am saying that by saying that it is a moral agent, it has the capability to recognize the difference between right and wrong and good and evil. That has nothing to do with influence. That has absolutely nothing. I know plenty of people who are fully moral agents who are completely influenced by other people. Go look up Milgram and tell me that those people are not influenced by people. Go look up any of the um, Nazi officers during the Holocaust and tell me that they were not influenced. They are still held culpable for every single action that they performed, and they should be held culpable for every action they performed because they are fully able to make a choice. Now, they chose to adhere to the influence of another person. That was a choice. It's an uncomfortable conversation. It should be an uncomfortable conversation. 
But I am not saying that a moral agent is not under the influence of something outside of its own power. Actually, most moral agents, most humans are under influence of something outside their own power, whether that be a boss at work, whether that be a military commander, whether that be a, um, you know, a situation where you have uh, you're, you're signing a contract. There are still choices to be made and you can choose to do that now. OK, let's take. Yeah, go for it. I'm going to cut you off. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, cut yeah, you off. We're going to do a quick ad break. We're going to come back. You're going to concisely finish that thought. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. And then and then we're going to uh, kind of go into a roundtable debate and just talk about I'm going to throw out a bunch of different things because yeah, th- you've kind of gotten through it and we can just we can practice. We could practice the the philosophy and the ethics behind it and the morality, mm-hmm. ethics of morality, because it is a weird thing. So we will be right back. In a world where solid state electronics and vacuum tubes are still meta, people never stop loving atomic powered everything. A chosen 500 stepped inside a subterranean vault to be spared the nuclear horror of the inevitable Great War. 25 years later, they emerge after the fallout settles to retake Appalachia. Among them, two former rivals whose blood feud will tear West Virginia apart in their epic struggle for survival. Chad, a vault bro who has a strength of 15, an intelligence of two, and is a complete wasteland dead. Simon, a complicated anti-hero who chooses light and hope, but accidentally becomes a cannibal, and wakes up naked and afraid with a Scorch Beast Queen after a date goes terribly wrong. What? I mean, it's a wild wasteland, right? This dark humor radio drama will have you driving off the road and crawling out from under the fallout. Two men. One wasteland. And so many nukes. Chad, a Fallout 76 podcast. Rated R. Now streaming on your holotape player podcasty thing. And moral agent... Wrap up. Yeah. So basically, uh, Wicked Wicked saying that, yeah, yeah, so the definition of a moral agent is, again, an entity that has the ability to discern right from wrong and to be held accountable for their actions. That is not to say that they are not being influenced. They are still they are still accountable for your action. You are always responsible for yourself. Like there is. So um, within the studies of Milgram, this was a response to the atrocities that were performed during World War II and World War I. Um, and it was basically shown that people will adhere to a social order um, and that it was a very big problem because they were like, basically, there was this this um, um, American mentality of like, oh, well, that was just the Germans and they're just, you know, they were other. That was the that was thing. Milgram's study kind of blew that out of the water and was like, no, that's humans. Like humans will defer responsibility. It's it's a form of uh, uh, dispersing responsibility. And then they can say, oh, well, I was just doing what I was told. That doesn't mean that you're not culpable. You had the choice and you chose because it was more convenient and more comfortable to do what you were told. That doesn't that doesn't remove the fact that you were you were the one that did it and you had the ability to do that choice. And yes, Green, I know it's a very uncomfortable topic, but yes, it's like voting. Uh, You have the ability to weigh in on a conversation, whether or not you think that you will have a a part to play in it. I mean, this is personally, this is why I vote every time is because I don't have room to complain if I don't participate. Um, I will complain. Most people who know me personally, I will complain quite a bit. But if I don't participate in my mind, I don't have room to do that. That's me just whining. So, okay. Ready for kind of a rapid fire round? Yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask if it's if it's a good or evil thing because that's kind of been our our theme of the evening, right? I'm talking about the morality of it. Are the pyramids responsible for a good or evil side? Are they good or are they evil? No. Blue. Yes. Yes, that they're evil. No. No, that they're not evil. No, they are responsible for understanding the difference between the two. Okay. Now, are they are their actions evil? 
Yep, I'm going to answer the same on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that's. I mean, without again, knowing the broad scope of without, things, without I mean, like you're you're operating. We're operating at a really big disadvantage because a we don't know their true intentions. Uh, we don't. I mean, this is could be said for anybody, but like we don't mm-hmm. know what they're actually intending. If their intention is we're going to destroy the traveler, then eh, I'm going to kind of go with yeah. That's probably not the best idea, but like. But why? Why are they after the traveler? Did the traveler do something? Like right. you know, there's there's a whole host of possibilities. Now, as someone who's looking at it from the perspective of a guardian, it's hard to see that as not being a bad thing because that's gonna negatively affect us. So when you deal with that, but but then that goes into the question of, I mean, is that is the person who gets punished for doing a crime, you know, to that person, we are doing a bad thing to them. Does that make us bad? I mean, n- not really. Like it depends. Again, it, intention is quite important there. I I view intention as quite important there personally. Um, so I I think that is a much more nuanced question. I think that they recognize good and evil. I think they recognize right and wrong. I don't know if I could tell you that they are evil or they are wrong with the information that i have available within the lore currently really quick to kind of expand on this like you said so wicked is asking for a little bit more clarity on that concept of moral agency um so for the example here is that it is possible to be able to recognize the path but it is that is it impossible to be able to recognize the path but have no control um so i see what you're saying here is like you know uh, which is slightly different than what black flag is. Is there a choice when it's your purpose? Um, again, if you can recognize, this is the problem with like the, the psychology of, um, you know, someone like Skinner, uh, the deterministic model is all great and good until you start making people aware of the deterministic model, because then you run into the problem of if you know, if I come up to you and I'm sorry for the sudden jump, but here, here's a, here's an example. If I come up to you and say, in the next five minutes, you're only going to turn left, you are now presented with a choice. Do you choose to turn left and, and adhere to that? Or do you choose to spite me and turn right? That choice is completely on you. But I have told you that everything that you've done in your life up until this point, you're going to do this. Now that I have told you that you have that information, you can process that information. And, and humans are of such a uh, mental state that we actually have the ability to change. Like once we are made aware of something, we can change it. Now, going back to Wicked's, you know, so example, I love this. This this, this is a very funny one. Um, you strap Raz to the hood of a car. You can see, She can see the left hand turn, but still I make her go right and she can't control that. Um, so she is a, she is not a moral agent in that specific scenario because she is not the one doing it. But what I'm saying is that, well, but okay, so yeah, dirt chat, sorry, chat's chat's talking. Um if you can't choose, my argument is that by recognizing that there is another option that is choosing. Like if I know that before me is is two options, then it is then it is my choice to either adhere to what I've been told is going to happen or to to deviate from that path. It's when you run into a scenario of I'm going to do, I only do, this is where it gets dicey because let's say there's two options, but I don't know that the second option exists. Then in my perceived reality, there are no options. I am doing the only thing that is available to me. That's where it starts getting dicey because again, intention is a large percentage or a large part of this entire conversation. And and your real your reality is also a very large part. That's where you kind of get into this kind of relativistic view of morality. Um, the fact is, may. oh yeah, go for it. So, part of what I've been doing for work now is I work in a lab. Now, if any of you have a decent biology background, stem cells are undifferentiated cells that can turn into any cell of the body. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking from the perspective of that cell, it can go in any direction it chooses. Now, I take neurogen 2 and treat it with the cell, and I force that cell to turn into a neuron. Mm -hmm. I'm making the choice for it. It isn't making the choice for itself, so it cannot be the one considered as the moral chooser of the decision. It is not culpable of that, that path. But that's the same as doing a computer program. 
right? A computer program, very similar. Computer programs can do anything that we program them to do. They, they have the full gamut of possibility, but we program it to do a very specific task. I will not be saying that a computer program is morally culpable of whatever actions it does because it was designed to do that. That is not, that is not the case with human beings. Human being like, you, you can't... The problem... <laughs> The problem with the the debate about free will is that it is something that just if you believe in it and you agree with the concept of free will and the ability to choose, it exists. It's not something that can get toggled on or off like a stem cell or or P fifty three or a computer program. You you will always have a choice to do either, you know, the right thing or the wrong thing in that situation. And the fact is, is that this is, again, this is where the conversation gets really sometimes uncomfortable because one person's right is another person's wrong. That's, that's kind of a universal standard. You know, anytime you go to war, you're going to see that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, there, the, the thing is, is like, there isn't an answer that I can give. Um, I don't have an answer is it's a, it's an exploration of this concept that really debates like this help. Um, the, sorry, hang on real quick. Yeah. And Chad is making the point that darkness isn't human and that's a hundred percent correct. The problem is, is that you're asking about our interpretation of things. And I, and I get that. And that's why I hesitate to say that darkness is evil. I'm not saying that they are not evil. I'm not saying that they are evil. What I am arguing about is that they are not capable. Like my problem is, is that they are rationalizing their actions by trying to defer and trying to what's referred to as kind of moral disengagement. Um, so what they're what they're doing is they're they're presenting what they do as merely a natural evil. Um, the problem with that is that by existing in a moral sense, uh, which is again a moral agent is able to recognize good and bad. Choices made are not natural or instinctive. They are, by their very definition, they fall into the category of moral choices. Evil actions that they are then performed are thus morally evil, not naturally evil. You can't exist as a moral agent and then deny that agency when it becomes inconvenient to your argument. So the fact that it can, the fact that the darkness is presenting or indicating the ability to recognize a choice that recognition firmly places the ownership of those choices and actions on the individual, not on nature. Um, again, I'm not casting aspirations against whether or not the darkness is evil or good. I'm saying that they are responsible and culpable for their actions. Um, the rationalization of his actions is really, um, that's my problem. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the moral disengagement of the, the situation. Um, and the reason why I have a problem with that is that by defining, you know, basically rationalization is something that you define the responsibility and ignore the problem. Uh, and it's a way of dulling recognition of wrongdoing and basically a process of neutralizing the ability to address the issue because to the defender, there is no error. That's my issue here. Um, we see that with Toland and the pyramids. Uh, Toland's presentation is actually more of a form of what's referred to as ethical fading. Uh, and this is basically where aspects of a decision disappear from view. You see this within the Darkness 3 card. Uh, this happens when the agent, Toland, focuses heavily on something other than the aspect of the decision, such as winning. You know, Toland's fat focus is there is no reason this is just the winning play. This is just how you win. This is blah, blah, blah. The problem with ethical fading is that because people tend to only see what they're looking for, if you don't look for an ethical issue, they are more likely to miss it altogether because to them it doesn't matter. It's a um, the ends justify the means. Uh, and so when you come to the pyramids presentation, this is something that's very, very similar, um, but it's it's a different form of what's referred to as moral myopia. Uh, it's it's a moral disengagement. And this is when the agent restructures reality in order to make their own actions seem less harmful than they actually are. And that's what they're doing when they do the stuff of like P53. Um, and it's like, again, I'm not trying to say that it's wrong or right. What I'm saying is that by pretending like they aren't responsible for their actions is that is wrong. 
that is not an uh, that is not an accurate statement. I am back. Sorry, Buddy had for listeners and everything. If Blue chooses to leave this in, I had Buddy just licking incessantly in my office at the floor. When I got up to see what was going on, he just ran downstairs and started eating clover like crazy. But he is acting fine now. I think he just had a very dramatic, I need something to help my tummy. That's all. Glad he's okay. Me too. Okay. So I think that brings us to natural evil. Yes. We kind of talked about natural evil a little bit. Natural evil being the um, things like... Would you say volcanoes, tornadoes, natural yeah, occurrences? Like, that I mean, weather. Can you even can you even assign evil to That's, it because of is, is it just because it's destruction? Yeah, yeah it's it's literally. Yeah. Okay. I, I think someone in chat made a comment earlier and was like, you know, what if you ask someone whose house just burned down, fire is evil to them. You know that that's a hundred percent accurate. You know, the people who are in in these wildfires right now, that's not a good thing. That's an evil thing. But the the reason why we have a difference in in terms is because exactly that remember if you remember the moral skeptic argument about the abuse of the term evil, that's exactly why. Mm-hmm. Because you can have something that is naturally evil and you are recognizing that it is not good, it is bad, it's very bad, but you also recognize that there is no one to punish for that. Like there there I can't I can't go out and be like your fault that the tornado destroyed this city. No, th- no, that's not how that works. Now, you know, well, if you want to talk about the history of that, I'm like the philosophy, not, not the philosophy, talk about the mythology. The I'm not going to talk about it. I can talk into- about it, <laughs> but I'm not going to because that's another fascinating problem. That's a that's a very psychological problem as well. And that and that is inherently well, I mean, it's just it's the natural correct. like realization yes. of what is natural evil versus what is something that is directed by a god or if, um, or gods if in the case of like Greek myth, mm-hmm, I mean, like that's, Greek mythology that's and whatnot. That's an argument for why you know witch hunts were such a popular thing is because humans have an innate have an innate need to control. They they want you, mm-hmm. you, humans humans as as people we want to be able to have control over our environments. And so when you're presented with something of, of a natural evil, especially of scopes of like very, very damaging natural evil events, um, it's a hundred percent natural for humans to, to gravitate towards this. Oh, well it's, it's them that did it, you know, or it's, or it's her that did it or him that did, you know, it's, that's a natural tendency that it doesn't matter what age or what like era you look at human. I mean, we still do it today. It, it's prevalent throughout the world right now. I don't think I need right. to expand on that at all. We need the accusatory statement to give us definition as to what caused the issue. Yes, because by by putting a cause on it, it makes it easier. It makes it easier to comprehend because this this is the problem of evil. Like this is this is theodicy at its core. Is why do bad things happen to good people, or why do bad things happen? <laughs> It's it's a debate right. that has been going since humans started debating the difference between good and evil. Like it, it's it's again, it's just trying to come to terms with what is happening in the world and the realization that, you know, and the coming to terms with something that, you know, sometimes there are things that are naturally out of our control. If you want to go into it a little deeper even though in our eyes we see it as natural, in the eyes of the mouse, the cat is inherently evil. Correct. Yep. And that's where your your contextual aspect of right and wrong really come in. Now, the debate there is that you know we are we are projecting a sense of morality onto the mouse and the cat because to the mouse and the cat, I would qu- that gets into the the culpability debate because you know to them to an animal if they if they are not self-aware in the sense of being able to, to determine which option to choose, again, this is going back to choice, then they are simply following uh, instinct and instinct. Right. But there, that's a very slippery slope to is, go down. It's though. extremely slippery. It's extreme. Welcome to philosophy. One Oh one. Like everything you say is going to be a slippery slope because you're going to have to chase it down and make sure that you're, you're very, 
careful on the terms that you use and the ways that you use them. But that, I mean, but that's also, that also is why we have the difference between natural and, I mean, like, and those are broad definitions. Even within those definitions, there are schisms and segregations of different types. Like, I mean, it's, it gets very detailed very quickly. Right. I think the problem with assigning natural evil to things such as cat and mouse, saying that instinct Instinct is a word that gets thrown around a lot for the idea of not having choice, but that is not necessarily true because instinct, I mean, you can, you still have the choice and so would a cat. A cat can make a choice between am I going to chase down this mouse or am I going to do something slightly different? I mean, there's, that's a real slippery slope to assign. And I think that's when you get down into like the, the idea of um, self-awareness and stuff like oh, that. Oh, angels, free will versus uh, humanity. You can have a being that does not necessarily have free will and therefore, I mean, it's hard to, I don't necessarily want to say therefore he has no choice, but there, because that's obviously not true according to stories too. So, well, and that's where you get the know. definition or that. Yeah. That, that was another conversation I've had and you know, I can, I definitely, I'm willing to have that conversation because there's there's explanations even within theological texts of that whole myth. I mean, that's that's been explained extensively too, um, from a from a religious or mythological standpoint. Um, so it's 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 again choice is a choice when you when you deal with morality when you deal with ethics, um, choice. And the recognition of choice is a huge linchpin to the entire conversation. Um, if you can recognize the choice, then you are you are on your way to being culpable of whatever you do. Whether or not right. you instinctually... Like, humans have instincts. I'm not saying that we don't have instincts. But humans also have the capability of suppressing those to a degree. I mean, there, there are some things that you will instinctually do. But you also can work your way around those instincts we have the ability to to in a way through a a mental way override those instincts you know the the tribal like the tribal need to to cast aspirations to the other and and deny them has been time and time again proven that we don't have to operate that way if we operated that way on the instinct and had no ability to choose the world would be a very much different place um and so the recognition that there is another option, that is a very big component to this entire debate. I have chocolate. Julie is my hero. Praise them. So, they're better. They're York peppermint patties. <laughs> is a York peppermint patty evil? No, chocolate's not evil. It's just disgusting. More importantly, <laughs> is blue is evil for now? thinking that York peppermint no, it's patties. I've, I've never said chocolate's evil. If I remember correctly, green is the one that casts chocolate as being evil. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I said it was disgusting. That has no, no, that's, that's the whole darkness light use of elemental debate there. <laughs> Chat. A New York peppermint patty is not evil. Drinking orange juice afterwards might be. Ooh, <laughs> Lana, dang! Drinking orange juice after doing a lot of things is borderline. Drinking evil. orange juice after brushing your teeth, using mouthwash, or- any Mexican food. Really, I mean that one can depending on how spicy. Anyway, we should wrap up this episode since brought we're to you adding by some of the of chocolate. This episode brought to you by York Peppermint Patty. If you would like to give us a sponsorship, I don't know which company makes this, but they should and give us a sponsorship. Hershey. Hershey. Hershey's. Contact us at focusfirechat at gmail.com. You know, when you talk about making the choice which leads you to being culpable, the one thing that always comes in my head is the old philosophy class like general if you see the people on the train tracks yeah, you pull the problem. lever to make it go left or right and hit the group or hit the mm-hmm. single and leave it alone that's the trolley problem and, yeah that's a fun yeah. one and 
the thing is, like, everyone's like, oh, you, you're not culpable until you make the choice to pull the lever. I'm like, yes, you are, because you're yeah. actively choosing not to. Correct. You are culpable the instant that you recognize the situation. <laughs> Which sucks, but I mean, I mean, it, it does. It, it's it's a terrible situation, but that's that's also the point of the trolley problem is that there is it's a lose lose situation. So then it becomes a debate. The trolley problem is used as a way to introduce the debate of is there a degree in evil? Is there you know what is what is the greater evil? Is killing five people more evil than you know killing the one person? And that's where you also start getting the different variations of trolley problems, which are always fun to listen to, because then you can have like, well, the one person is a prisoner and the five people are innocent school kids. Which one do you choose? And it's like, you know, this this is at its core is the trolley problem. Okay. I'm going to make a musical reference. Dwyer might get it. I know you won't, Jay. That's fine. Perfect. There is a character in Wicked called Fierro, and he oh, sings a song one. called Dancing Through... You do get this one. Yeah. He sings a song called Dancing Through Life. Mm-hmm. Would his character, because he is, his whole idea is don't think about it, don't make those hard decisions, would his character be considered good? Because mm-hmm. he can never actually make the choice in that. No. If you're going on the extreme end of things, obviously he is does have some choices, but if he was not able to make choice and he just basically could not recognize it. Would he be considered e- uh, evil? I don't know consider enough. Him anything. Yeah, I don't know enough. I know that he he's the one that the one that turns into the scarecrow, right? N- right, okay, but I'm, that's all I'm I know speaking about more. <laughs> or he's he's Tin Man. It's it's more oh, okay, of the okay. the concept of a character, a being, a human being who does not actually actively recognizes those situations right. he so purposefully uh, basically and i don't know if it's purposefully turns away from the situation or just doesn't ever look at those situations well and see that's where intention could you comes even in. have somebody like that yes you can mm-hmm. yeah, and that's where intention comes in because if you're intentionally looking away from a situation that is a choice you are looking away but if you are just if you're not aware of the situation then you're not you're not culpable of that that's this is that's why these debates get so dicey is because a lot of it is like you know were you aware of the situation well no Mm -hmm. i mean okay now are you lying or you know like there's a whole there's a whole different thing going on there and that's why you know within within there's a a whole game based on it yep there i is that a reference to the one that i don't know anything about Yep, okay, it is. Cool. It's a reference to Among Us. Um, Very good. So, but like the whole thing with that is that's why with it, like, so from uh, from a religious standpoint, that's why a lot of times um, a lot of religions hold that, you know, at the end of a person's life, they're weighed by a god. They're determined, they are, they are judged by something that is more than humans because that is entity whoever that is whether that's you know osiris and maat whether that's you know the god of christianity whether that's the Mm -hmm. the vikings pantheon or whatever you have the judge the ending judge the ending judge is always a supernatural being that can see into that's why within the osiris maat mythology they they have two they have two components they have the the trial and then at the very end maat weighs the heart of the plaintiff and the heart is feather, right yeah against the feather and then that's where you have either he gets consumed and by um i just blanked on its name or it goes to the, the paradise crocodile. uh it's the crocodile slash monkey slash something um Set. Mm-hmm. A pe- yeah thank you thank you um but so that's that's that that's where that kind of stems from is because there's a recognition that the intention really does matter and none of us are capable of knowing fully another person's intention. Like, we don't know the full extent of a person's culpability of that. Um, that's where that kind of comes from is because then that's kind of that inspiration to be like, no, if you if you have good intentions, even if something does happen, if you are truly trying to be the best you can, there is hope 
that there is someone who will recognize that. And there's also a determent, deterrent there, because if you're not a good person, if you're being, if you're actively choosing to be a bad person and you are doing good for wrong intentions, then there is also the case that, okay, you did all the good things, but it was for the wrong reasons. And there is a punishment mm-hmm. waiting for you for that. And so there's that inspiration that's kind of like that social contract, social cohesion unit for that. Do you remember, Green, and right, I'm going to dig back, probably, God, okay. that was a year and a half. It was last March, right? Pretty much like the first few income. weeks when you were meeting me. Oh, God. Okay. I was still in school with my um, uh-huh. interesting setup there. And do you remember the project where I had to design my own religion? Yes, vaguely. So, out of the tail end of this, it was the weird idea where it is not, in fact, a god judging you at the end, but you judging yourself while looking back on the decisions you make. Well, okay, so there's actually a show based around that very same premise. The Good Place. (laughs) Um... Now, I know Jay has a lot to say about that aspect, (laughs) but the basis of it is kind of that same idea of you're you're looking back and the problem that they discover within the good place is that based off of everything that Jay was saying, there's no way that a person could, quote unquote, be good any like wholly good and make it to the good place. That's the problem with the good place. There's there's no way to get in there anymore just because of being tied to so many different things that would be considered evil in some way, shape or form that they couldn't make it in. And they go through and I it's there's just watch the show. I'm not going to spoil the ending, but just watch the show if you want some fun, slightly philosophical talk without blowing up Blue's mind. If you just want Blue's side of it, just ask him and he'll tell you. <laughs> what? No. That was a conversation. How long did that one take? Do you remember? That was a couple days. <laughs> I think if I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. It was a good one, but, though. Sorry, Dwyer. I didn't mean to, like, be like, bam, grab onto that one. No worries. It's an, interest, it's an interesting idea, just the concept of good versus evil versus light versus dark, because we're automatically assigning the idea of evil to darkness, even though there's still, I still say there's still aspects of that that is still left up for interpretation, because what if we're not dealing with the darkness directly, but an avatar of the darkness? And then does that mean that the avatar has choice? If so, does that choice, it's this, that's just a non never ending hole to go down the entire time. Yes. I also think part of why we're attributing darkness to evil is just as human society. And as a society of people who used to live in fear of darkness way back when, it's what we have naturally done forever. Think of like when you were a kid, oh, nothing good happens after midnight. Oh, all the monsters mm-hmm. come out at night. It's that theory that once the sun goes down, nothing good comes of it. Right. Oh, well, that's because there's the natural fear, right? The whole, excuse me, the whole, um, you're less protected. You have less sense around you within the dark because we naturally need light because we attribute a lot of our existence to seeing things. It reminds me of there's a comedian who always makes fun of his kids because they're, he's like, they have really bad decisioning processes because, you know, they're scared of all these monsters coming up from the hell, you know, and all this stuff. And they're like, but if you leave the light on, they're safe. He's like, because, you know, 60 watts of nothing is going to stop <laughs> It's like yeah, that's I mean, that, that's true, magical though. thinking. That's it's, magi- it's the magical thinking of uh, of of a kid and of you know but, that. But you, not even that. Like it's the it's the natural instinct of it, right? Like right. you think back to prehistoric times, or even not even then, just um, pioneer times. 
having a campfire, Mm -hmm. there's something about having light and having the ability to sense things coming that gives you the chance to react. That's the whole point of having light. It gives you the ability to react to that darkness if there's something that comes from it. Maybe that's the real... That's the real trick of destiny, realizing that our light is just, it is a beacon. Well, but, it will draw darkness, quote unquote, to us. Well, and that's but, the whole thing. Uh, the, brighter, the brighter the light, the deeper the darkness. But the other thing with fire yeah. going down that too is that often the other thing is, is that the predators of which we were very much at, uh, threatened by, fire actually kept them away as well. Mm-hmm. Like animals have a have a heightened sense of fear when it comes to fire, and you know most animals will stay away from it. So that's why you know evolutionary wise, that's where that kind of that adherence to the campfire, that adherence to the the light, kind of helped drive that home for a lot of humanity. If fire was the initial deterrent, then the ability or the instinct that was driven into us to be near the light source makes sense why a 60 watt light bulb makes a kid feel better yes, exactly. or even a 30 watt yeah, no yeah it's 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 the it's that innate that innate need for safety and that's that's the a lot of times that's and, I, and there's not that's not universal either so but yes Black I, Flag mentions that it can also, well, yeah. Wicked mentioned it, that you can blind too. So too much light can also be detrimental. Have to have, you have to have shadows to be able to actually sense things, I think, at least more deeply. Yes, I would agree. Because shadows also gives you depth of perception as well. It gives you shape, it gives you distance, it gives you size. Yep. Mm-hmm. Gives you perspective in, in general. But, uh... Yeah. Wrap up? Yeah. You want me to just end Let's it? Let's do it. Or do you want to wrap you up? You guys don't have another two hours in you? I mean, I do. I mean, but I don't know if how, the podcast How amped does. up are you, Dwyer? We can go on. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I don't all know. You, all you hear is a... <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I was actually kind of hoping for it. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't and put it past me. I've done crash. it before. <laughs> I'm aware. You've done it while I've been on mic. Have I? Mm-hmm. It can't be as bad as when I... So, what we used to do is... I used to get up for work, what, 5.45 every morning? Work from 6 to 3, run home, get cleaned up, eat something, then go to baseball from 6 at night to 11, come home and we'd try to raid. Right. Normally make it into the first encounter or two and I'd just pass out in the middle of the raid. Yeah, no. I like sleep. I like to loot. That's fair. <laughs> so, shout outs? Dwyer, do you have any shout outs? Uh, first of all, you guys. Being awesome and welcoming as always. Um, my new job for helping me actually pay the bills. <laughs> also, I have somebody with a new, pers- well, not new perspective, a unique connection slash perspective to P53 Blue. So if we need to talk about that card for an entire episode, Dwyer could possibly help us with that. Ah. Crazy scientist over here. I hate that card so much. (laughs) But, yeah. Yeah. um, Otherwise, just the Destiny community as a whole, you know. And Bungie, I suppose, for y'all being awesome and giving us lore and everyone reading in and being here. Yeah. Blue, do you have any shout outs? Uh, no. Cool. My shout out goes to just just people. Just all the people right now. All the people who are dealing with the stress of life, 2020, parents, fires, politics, whatever. I... It's been, okay, so the reason I haven't been by, and it's been a, f- it's a been a few weeks since I've been on the show. Reason I haven't been by is I've had a lot of really rough times myself, and that I, in particular, am struggling with depression. And my mother t- called me on Tuesday to tell me that she has cancer, and that they are going to be doing a biopsy soon. So that has been very, very. Sh- difficult for me to process but i saw a tweet by elaine who nerd and needle if you guys don't know her she does really awesome patches 
also is dating My Name is Bife and is just a wonderful human being. And she was talking about how her day has been super rough. And I posted something underneath it that tough times don't last, tough people do. And I'm going to kind of take that on as my new mantra. And I hope that you guys do too, because we all joke about how 2020 is the worst. And it is. But you are all tough people. And I want to thank those p- tough people out there who stick out, stick their necks out for things that they believe in and kind of stick with it. We'll make it through. Blue. As always, thank you for your time. And until next time, remember, with wisdom we conquer, stand strong, stand tall, and keep exploring. With that, we'll begin to wrap the chat up. Thank you again to those over on Twitch for coming to spend your evening with us. If you'd like to join us for the live streaming of the episodes, please be sure to give us a follow over on twitch.tv slash focusedfirechat. Links to all our episode archives can be found at www.thelorenetwork.com. Please be sure to email us at focusfirechat at gmail.com with any comments and or questions for the team concerning the podcast. And let us know how we're doing by giving us some feedback and a rating over on iTunes as well. So until next time, focus your fire and may your light shine bright. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.